Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel. Honestly, you don't want to be taking generic legal advice from a YouTube channel or podcast in any event. On with the show. Write-offs, shutdowns, layoffs, and restructuring, a gaming lawyer's perspective. Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing partner of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today, unfortunately, we're going to talk about something that we've gotten a chance to talk about quite a lot on Virtual Legality, which is restructuring, layoffs, change to the industries we follow, whether in business, in video games, or otherwise. Where previous episodes of Virtual Legality had focused on discussing layoffs that impacted video game companies themselves, like Electronic Arts and Activision. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the restructuring that is currently happening in respect of video game journalism. And this came up because uh, on Friday uh, I was very happy to be involved in an article that Variety Gaming put out uh, that was called What We Can Learn from a Game Studio Co-Founder's Public Tirade which is not a topic that I covered on this channel uh, prior to now, but it was about Randy Pitchford of Gearbox getting on Twitter and really saying some things that wound up causing a little bit of consternation, a little bit of problem for him uh, and for his company that's trying to sell Borderlands 3 uh, in the fall. And you can take a look at this article. I think it's really well done. It's by Mike Futter, who I have been uh, involved with as a source and as discussing things from a business and legal perspective for a number of the articles that he has done in the past six months or so, and he wanted to delve into this issue from both a public relations standpoint and a business and law standpoint. So you can see as we scroll down here through this uh, article, uh, you see the reference to me, Richard Hogue of the Hogue Law Firm, and I discuss from a contractual perspective uh, the kinds of things that you can do as a publisher to try to, if not control, curtail some of the problematic disclosures that the CEO of your developer might be engaged in or that somebody else that is related to the product that you're trying to sell might be engaged in. I thought when Mike approached me with this topic that it was an excellent and novel angle to really kind of analyze what is becoming, as social media grows and grows and grows, a more significant problem for publishers and developers and that relationship between them. I think Variety Gaming has done a great job for the last year or so in having these different kind of angles that they approach their uh, news and their stories about the video game industry. So I have had it on my bookmark list for some time. Unfortunately, the same day that this article went live, which again, I recommend reading, I will link it in the description of this video, Brian Crescenti put out a tweet, and if you're familiar with him at all, he's been around a lot of stuff in the video game community. He's been involved with a lot of video game journalism over the past decades, uh, and including working with Rolling Stone on Glixel and now on uh, Variety Gaming. His tweet says, I see word is getting out about Variety Gaming. Good news, bad news. We're going to have some great E3 coverage this year. And also, I will no longer have a job the day this show ends. Ain't no party like an E3 party. Obviously, that's a glib way to address that news, as Twitter is a glib kind of forum. But this was later confirmed by him and in other areas on Twitter and elsewhere that Variety Gaming is essentially reassessing whether or not it's going to exist as a vertical, as a separate section of the the Variety news stream, and that Brian is going to be out of a job. That this site that I had contributed to in terms of sourcing for some articles that they had done and that I enjoyed for a year was going to go away. Uh, And that's not to say that I agree with everything that Variety Gaming has ever put out there. If you follow me on social media, you know I didn't like a couple of the reviews they did. In particular, the Division 2 review is very focused on an analysis of the current state of Washington, D.C. and what kind of things that Division 2 with its gunplay in Washington is saying about society and about capitalism and about these kinds of things. And you know if you follow Virtual Legality and you followed some of the other Virtual Legality extra episodes that I do that tend to be a little bit more commentary focused, like this one rather than news focused, that... I'm okay with that. I'm okay with different voices. I think the industry is big enough, is broad enough, and and should be able to support a a financial livelihood for these different kinds of voices, whether or not I like everything that they put out. And uh, I I think 
it's important when we're reflecting on these things to, to look at it and say, if you like virtual legality, if you're listening to this on a podcast or watching this as a YouTube video, that a lot of what we do here depends on somebody somewhere reporting what's happening. There's only so much that you can kind of put together in terms of research and analysis from tweets or from reset era posts and, and things of that nature. You really do need people on the ground with the context that can go get the quotes that have professionals in their Rolodex, their electronic Rolodex, that can get quotes from folks like me, sure. But if you look at that article from Variety Gaming, for quotes from a, an actual PR person working in the industry that can talk about how PR thinks about what happened there and what they might do to help fix it or what they might change or not change. And you get those extra insights because there's a guy like Mike Futter going and getting those quotes, putting together an article, working all those hours to get something out there. And then it's something that folks like me on virtual legality or elsewhere on YouTube or in different podcasts can look at, can analyze, can add their two cents in. And that's how you get a good ecosystem. And that's regardless of whether or not you agree with everything Variety Gaming puts out or everything that someone else puts out, Polygon, what have you, whatever your favorite site is, I guarantee you there's something that they put out at some point that you didn't like or that you didn't agree with. And that's just the way things are. And honestly, that's the way things should be. I like to say to my friends and family, if everybody were like me, I would hate it. Uh, and there's a great Twilight Zone episode about that, that where someone wishes for everyone to be like them because they're misanthropic and they don't like other people uh, being different from them. And he gets his wish. And like every good Twilight Zone, it turns out to be exactly the opposite of what he what he wanted, what he needed. Uh, and so I really think that is the case. And if you follow this channel, you saw I did a video, I think it was in February, called uh, It's About Ethics in Gaming Journalism, tongue-in-cheek referencing the, the clarion call of uh, the, the Gamergate folks because I, I think it's funny. Uh, but that I said, hey, there's a lot of stuff I don't agree with in the way things are covered in the video game industry, but I'm very happy that they exist. Uh, and, and one of those things that I referenced uh, was an article on uh, the site called Waypoint, uh, which was a subsidiary brand uh, of the Vice Network. And they took a focus on video games that I didn't particularly love. It wasn't a site that I thoroughly enjoyed, but I liked that it existed, where they did kind of a critical analysis of concepts and themes in video games. And the article I pointed out in that video was, I believe, about the fact that in Resident Evil 2, the remake in January, the fact that a police station was a, was offered as a safe haven and offered a sense of safety would not be received by others that had had uh, bad connections with the police. And I looked at it and said, well, that's, I think, reading into it a little bit much for a zombie game, but I'm glad that it exists. Uh, and so the next piece of news as kind of a combination to this that happened with Variety Gaming, which I'm thoroughly going to miss and not the least of which because I think they did a great job and included me in a number of their articles – is that Waypoint is going away itself. So we've got here an article from Vice that says, Waypoint is joining the new Vice.com. New URL, same us. So as I said, they were a subsidiary brand. They had their own kind of branding. They had their own website. And it says, starting today, Waypoint is joining forces with Vice's incredible network of sites. And together we're merging into a single destination, the new Vice.com. Going forward, you'll find all of our work at Vice.com slash games. So this is essentially the preamble, I would say, to what you see at Variety Gaming going away. And while it doesn't sound like the worst thing if you're not used to following these things in business or in, in marketing or in just journalism, uh, it is probably the starting point, the vanguard for what will be, at, at bare minimum, a reassessment of what back office support is needed at Waypoint, what redundancies exist if they're going to exist in the vice environment and probably a general thrust away from whatever waypoint was doing and towards a more generalized approach for vice so this is kind of the start of what we would expect to see as uh, layoffs or reorganization or restructuring they might be moved to different parts of the organization if vice continues to exist and we're going to get to that a little bit more in just a second but this like variety gaming is another one of those sites that was trying to do something more than consumer reports. And I think consumer reports are valuable. I espoused this in that previous video that I mentioned, which is I think there is a usefulness to having sites that say, hey, this video game runs good. Hey, this video game has nice gunplay or has nice puzzle elements or has good characterization and I really like this story. Whatever it is, I think there's a usefulness to saying, this worked for me. 
Now, I think that usefulness has gone away, has been minimized a little bit because of YouTube and Let's Plays and the fact that people that are interested in playing the game can go and see how that game is played for themselves in real time and don't have to work through a middleman to get their interpretation of what the game looks like. But I still think that's useful. These sites, Waypoint, Variety Gaming, some others that have gone through some tough times. You see all Kotaku, uh, as part of the Gizmodo group, was sold to private equity, and I would strongly expect that they will have their own reorganization and changes in the very near future. These groups are trying to do something a little bit different. They're trying to not be consumer reports, and I think that's important and that's interesting even when I don't agree with them, even when I don't like them. And that's often... I think it's very useful if you're a member of society, if you're interested in learning things, if you're listening to virtual legality of all things, to get all those different perspectives. Uh, my Twitter feed is full of things from Vox and Huffington Post and Fox News, and I get everything from every side of the political spectrum because I want to know what people are thinking. I want to know what the best ideas are. I want to analyze those best ideas and agree with them or disagree with them as makes sense to me. And I think the loss of places like Waypoint and the loss of places like Variety Gaming is something that will be keenly felt in the video game spectrum. Now, my hope is that this is market movement, that there isn't money being made in the way that they would hope in these various uh, journalistic outlets, but that it will be allocated to something that is what people want, that is something good for the gaming industry entirely. That's the optimism in me. Uh, but in the immediate near term, without these kinds of outlets, there is going to be less interesting articles about the video game industry. And that makes me sad. And to put a, a more fine point on this Waypoint situation, if you look at this and you say, well, Waypoint joining Vice doesn't mean that they're going away necessarily. I wanted to bring up an article that I found interesting, and we're going to talk a little bit about what it means on a technical business level, which is what we do here at Virtual Legality, uh, is an article from Vox that says Disney put more than $400 million into Vice Media. Now it says that investment is worthless. A now familiar story, investors say they overvalued a high-flying digital publisher. The article starts, just a few years ago, big media companies were falling over themselves to bet on Vice Media. Disney made the biggest bet by putting more than $400 million into the swashbuckling digital publisher. Now, Disney says all of the money it put into Vice has been incinerated. In investor filings Wednesday, Disney said it no longer thinks it will ever get any return on the investment it made in Vice, a company that at one point was supposedly worth $5.7 billion. Now, we're going to read a little bit more of this article, but let's take a look at what the actual quarterly filings of Disney say about this topic in particular, because I did think that that was interesting. So we're going to go over to that right now. And again, if you're not familiar with how public companies operate, what makes them public, what makes them have to do more things for the Securities and Exchange Commission is that they have to make quarterly and annual filings as well as filings when something special happens. And so this is the quarterly filing for Disney. And the sentence that I want to focus on here is right in the middle of your screen. It says, the company also has assets that are required to be recorded at fair value on a non-recurring basis. Let's take that down a notch for a second. So this means the company owns things. Right, All companies own things. They own, uh, in the case of Disney, they own cameras. Uh, they own uh, the intellectual property that is what they wind up filming or making cartoons about. They own the theme parks and they own the cups that they use to uh, put drinks in to sell to people that visit the theme parks. Those are the assets that they hold. And when you're talking about describing the financial position of a company, they get to say what their assets are to show exactly how strong their company is. It says these assets are evaluated when certain triggering events occur, including a decrease in estimated future cash flows that indicate the asset should be evaluated for impairment. Let's take that sentence back a notch. So we're ultimately going to be talking about the fact that Disney owns an equity stake in Vice. That means they own some percentage of Vice, and I wasn't able to find it in the materials that I looked at in preparation for this video, but they own some percentage in Vice that they bought for, as was described by Vox, $400 million dollars. Uh, and they, we'll see in that article, it might be $500 million, depending on whether Fox invested and when they bought Fox, they essentially took on that investment. Long story short, they own this equity in Vice. And the way that the generally accepted accounting principles, GAAP, would suggest that you evaluate what that's worth is that you take what you think that company is going to make into the future and you evaluate it against what you paid for it. And if you think that the estimated future cash flows, that's the phrase that you see there, is going to get below what it is that is you're showing on your listing of what these assets are worth, you start to consider them impaired, 
they are worth less in reality than what you have shown on your financial statements. Now, taking one more step back, I think it's important to know what generally accepted accounting principles are. They are principles. They are not laws. They are guidelines. We've talked a lot about guidelines on this channel in the recent past. So you understand if you followed this channel that that means that there's a big giant gray area. There's a lot of ambiguity for folks to decide exactly where things fit in. And so the the gap principles don't come in and say you're wrong or you're right about how you are evaluating the value of your assets. They say here are the things that you need to consider and here are the things that you can do when you think that they are impaired. In this particular financial statement, continuing on with what it actually says, they say for the quarter and six month period ending March 30th, 2019, the company recorded an impairment charge of $353 million for the write-off. Keep that that language in your head, write-off, not write-down because those are distinct, of an equity method investment as a result of a level three fair value measurement. The impairment was recorded in equity in the income, lost of investees net in the consolidated statements of income. Now, you don't see the word vice there. You basically have to put a bunch of stuff together. But this is describing what happened with their vice investment. And what that sentence says is it says, as of March 30th, 2019, we have looked at the estimated future cash flows of what we think vice can make us. And we have looked at it and determined that essentially we think they are zero. And we, be, we believe that following gap in the principles that we have to use to evaluate these things, we are within the bounds of those principles to say that it is zero. We're going to talk about why that's a little bit distinct from them actually believing it's zero in just a second. But that the $353 million that are still on our books for having been invested in vice, we're going to just say those are worth zero. So the next time you see the financial statements for this, we're not going to show that investment as an asset at all. It's not an asset. We think it's worth nothing. And From a strategic standpoint, if it makes money in the future, essentially that's all gravy from the financial standpoint. And and so that's what Disney has said. Strategically, because they are principles, because you can kind of time these things, because you are already guessing at what future cash flows are, that's what the word estimated is doing there, you can kind of position when you want to make these impairment uh, decisions, when you want to write down things, when you want to write off things within the principles. You have to be ethical. You have to have reasons for what your belief is. But a lot of times you see this happen when you want to set up a future financial statement or your current financial statement is already bad uh, or if it is good in some other way that you think you can hide some bad information in in a different way. If you think about this as interpersonal communications and you've got some bad news for somebody, sometimes you want to put that with good news. Sometimes you want to put that with all the bad news all at once so that you can have a financial statement that says, look at all this bad stuff. And then when the next quarter rolls around, you can hit them with better stuff. But there is a little bit of positioning here. It doesn't necessarily mean that Disney entirely thinks Vice is completely worthless. It means that there's reasons under the generally accepted accounting principles that they can claim that it's worthless. And if it makes money in the future, they'll be more than happy to take it. Um, So it's a little bit more nuanced than that, but it does suggest that Waypoint is in serious, serious trouble because the lead investor in Vice doesn't believe in it anymore. So that means a couple things. That means if they're going down, if they're having problems with cash flow, they probably can't turn to Disney for more money. They probably can't turn to whoever was in Disney's syndicate of investors for more money. They probably can't turn to some other avenues once people can see that this is what Disney believes about the asset that follow these kinds of big players that are involved in investing a lot of money. So Waypoint itself is probably in trouble insofar as Vice itself is also in trouble. Uh, And so Vox got this right. They said that Disney says it has been incinerated, the value of the money that it has put in. But they also say Vice is still worth something in some investors' eyes. Last week, a group of lenders said they put a fresh round of $250 million into the company. So that's good news. But Disney's accounting decision is yet another example, perhaps the most stunning one, of the turnabout we've seen in digital media over the past few years. Investors have decided that high-flying publishers that once confidently explained that they'd created a new media paradigm are now worth very little or even less. Here's a partial roll roll call familiar to some of you. And I want to go over this list because I think it's interesting. But it does show that the state of the current journalism world in all industries, not just video games, is in a massive, massive amount of flux. And I think that's something that should worry everybody that is interested in news uh, because we really should want to see this sorted out in some way. 
Journalists need to be able to make a living, and they need to be able to report on these things because otherwise there isn't commentary like virtual legality. There isn't commentary like what other po folks put out there on their podcasts or on their YouTube. And so I think this is worthwhile to note for everybody that's interested in these kinds of things. The roll call is Mike, which was a, a Millennium-focused uh, website, I believe, which raised more than $60 million, sold for less than $5 million late last year, and I think it was impaired by debt at the time. Mashable, which was valued at about $250 million three years ago, sold for less than $50 million two years ago. The properties, the properties known as Gawker Media, plus The Onion and other sites, just sold for a price that's likely well below $50 million. Univision, the TV conglomerate, which sold them off, had paid $135 million for the Gawker sites alone in 2016. And we talked about that at length uh, in the video about the Gizmodo Group sale. Please check that out earlier in Virtual Legality. And then it said, we don't yet know the value that Comcast, which put a collective $600 million into Vox Media and BuzzFeed over the past few years, now thinks those two publishers are worth. But it's a reasonable bet that Comcast thinks they are worth less than it thought in 2015. And the article goes, all of these companies have different stories and different particulars. The through line is that a few years ago, all of them were confident that they were going to shoot up in value because they knew how to reach young audiences by exploiting the big tech platforms, in particular Facebook and Google. And I want to take one step aside here from my business experience. As you probably know, if you follow this channel at all, or if you don't, I have been involved extensively in my career in venture capital and mergers and acquisitions. And those two fields uh, often relate to funding companies before they've proven that they can do anything, that you're making a big bet on a company because of what could happen in the future. And a lot of the times, those are failures. Uh, one of the jokes that I have is that you, you fund nine venture capital companies so that the one that makes a billion dollars can fund the eight failures. But that's the truth of the thing. And Disney and Comcast and these other folks that are invested in media already are trying to get ahead of whatever the next big thing is. And so you saw in the past few years a bit of what m one might call a bubble uh, that they invested in these things on the premise that they could really succeed. And now they are having this difficulty because that monetization the, the way that they can make money out of these products just hasn't materialized in the way they thought possible. So the last thing I wanted to talk about really briefly is just what a write down is. I said to put a pin in that and to hold it for what Disney uh, described it as, uh, but it is pretty much what it sounds like. It says here in Investopedia, which is a great site if you're ever interested in kind of uh, definitions of things that you might see in financial statements or that you might hear on virtual legality. What is a write-down? Not a write-off. So we start with write-down. A write-down is an accounting term for the reduction in the book value of assets whose fair market value has fallen below the book value and thus become an impaired asset. We just talked about it in this, in this video. But when you get an asset, you put something down in your books as what you think it's worth. And if reality proves as the years march on that it isn't worth what you thought it was worth, it becomes impaired and you have to decide exactly what you're going to do with describing it in your financial statements. Investopedia goes on to say write downs can have a huge impact on a company's net income and balance sheet. During the financial crisis, the drop in the market value of assets on the balance sheets of financial institutions forced them to raise capital to meet minimum capital obligations. They had an obligation to keep a certain amount of assets in their company under regulatory requirements. And when all of their assets went down at once, they had major, major problems. That's part of the 2008 story. Accounts that are most likely to be written down are a company's goodwill, accounts receivable, and long-term assets like property, plant, and equipment. What we saw in the vice description in Disney was actually a kind of goodwill combination. It was an equity write-down, and that was their shareholdings in vice. And it says here, uh, when you're talking about that accounting, you can choose a few of the ways that you want to handle it, like we discussed in this video. Uh, and I don't want to get too deep into accounting strategies and things of that nature. As I like to say in the law, I know enough to be dangerous. Please talk to your CPA if you've got real significant accounting questions. Uh, but I do discuss a lot of uh, accounting questions with my clients as part and parcel to putting companies together, getting them funded and getting them organized, which is what we do at Hogue Law. Um, so I recommend checking out this article. It really does focus on what a write-down is versus a write-off. And the big primary thing that I wanted you to take away is that a write-off really does mean it goes to zero. That a write-down is a reduction. And when you see a term like write-off, as we saw in the Disney description, uh, write-off means that they really think that it's gone to zero. And if they get some money out of it in the future, then they'll be perfectly happy with it. But they have essentially no belief that that will ever come. And if it comes, it will be uh, a, a miracle and they'll be happy with it. Finally, I wanted to finish off with how Vox finished their article. And I'm going to link this in the description. There is some stuff that I skipped that I highly recommend checking out. This is a good article and a good description of what's happening here. 
but it says, here's a comment on Wednesday's financial news from a Vice spokesperson. So this is a person at Vice that is uh, essentially trying to push back against the the narrative that they are in trouble or that Disney writing them off uh, is a big, significant problem for them. This quote is, Vice is firing on all cylinders and on target to meet, if not exceed its financial targets for the third straight quarter. Our new executive team strategic plan is well underway, and with the recent capital raise, we will continue investing in the long-term growth of our five global businesses, television, studio, digital news, and our advertising agency, Virtue. As the media industry consolidates and fewer players control the information and entertainment that the world consumes, Vice will always be there with a megaphone for the more than half of the people on this planet under the age of 30 who crave independent world-class content. Now, that's an interesting quote because as we just saw, Comcast and Disney, which are two major media pipelines, are major investors in Vice. So the independence of Vice is somewhat in question. It's it's essentially uh, a play like a microbrew that happens to be owned by Anheuser-Busch to have something that goes out there that is branded as more independent than what they're putting out there themselves. But outside of that, you do see confidence from the Vice team that they think everything's going to be fine. And certainly with $250 million more in the bank account than they had at the start of last week, I think there's reason to believe that they could succeed. However, when you have major investors essentially say, ah, we're out, we don't believe in this anymore, that does start to sound problematic. And certainly when you see something like Waypoint being folded in to Vice, that itself is problematic. So in short, This was a week of relatively bad news around the video game journalism spectrum. I think it's a week uh, that we will reflect on in the coming months and say, hmm, I wish there were a few more voices out there. I hope that new voices spring up and start talking about video games in interesting and different ways. And here's the thing. Even if I don't like them, even if I don't agree with them, I think they're useful. I think they're interesting. I think that's what fuels the reset eras and the neo gaffs and the reddits and the Facebooks and the tweets and the virtual legalities of the world. And I think they're necessary. I think they're important. And I think more, most of all, they help keep the video game industry going. They help keep people interested in it. And that's my two cents. That's virtual legality today. Uh, If you like this video, I talk about these things all the time. Not usually with such a commentary focus. I usually talk more about business and law. As you can see from Friday's episode, I talked about the legal issues posed by the United States senator that proposed a microtransaction ban. I've talked about the Xbox guidelines and exactly how problematic they are, given that they can take away your account for things like playing a game before its release date. And I talk about other pop culture items like Game of Thrones and Avengers Endgame and things like that. So if you like that, if you like this video, like, subscribe. Otherwise, if you watch this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. If you listen to this on a podcast service, thank you so much for listening. Please rate it on whatever podcast service that you're listening to it on. I would really appreciate that. Otherwise, share it around. Tell your friends. We're a growing channel. We're very excited about the growth so far, uh, but we could always be growing faster, and we very much appreciate your help in doing that. Otherwise, I will catch you on the next Virtual Legality.